But uh, can you um, tell me a little bit, uh, you know, Sherry, about uh, how you got started painting and a little bit about your development and what you see? Sure. Okay. Okay, so basically, um, I did a lot of artwork in high school, like, like most people do. And then when I got out in the world, I thought, oh, I'll go do commercial art. And I went to school in Denver for a year for a two-year program. But, um, and then I ended up not doing it. It just wasn't for me. Ended up going to school, getting an MBA and all that kind of good stuff. So when I stopped to uh, raise my children, a friend wanted me to take a watercolor class. And I thought, yeah. So we took that and I found I really liked it. So I kept taking classes and eventually worked my way into oil. But I did watercolor for about five or six years. And um, I, I just don't believe those people that say watercolor is easier than oils. Watercolor is way harder. Totally agree with <laughs> yeah. you. Totally agree with you on that. I know. So when you see a really good watercolor, you know the, the skill and talent that went into doing that. But um, yeah, I ended up just painting in oils. And then Deke uh, Palecek is the one who got me started doing the plein air and started doing some of that with her. And then it just developed into uh, more of a passion. And so I do a lot of plein air, not this year, of course, but um, typically I do a lot of plein air. It, it's, I need deadlines. I need um, some kind of motivation a lot of times to want to paint. I'm not as disciplined as other people. I mean, I paint most every day, but it's because I know there's something coming up and that I've got to keep my skills sharp. And that's what works for me. But that's what I've been doing. Um, there's just lots of painting on my own this summer. All my events got canceled. I was on my way to uh, Louisiana, got to St. Louis, got a phone call saying it was canceled. So I turned in downtown uh, St. Louis and drove back home. That was the end of the plein air season for the year. <laughs> oh, so now when you say skills, like when you transitioned from watercolor to oil, you know, there's certain things all, that all painting have in common, among mm -hmm. them being composition and, uh, you know, you know, basic design, you know, all sorts, you know, but the, the approach, you know, with watercolor is one of, you know, th there's a certain amount of decisiveness you have to have at the very beginning right. that is different from oil painting for, for, to a certain extent. Would you yes. say? Well, the thing with watercolors, I think you have to have more of a plan before you start. I mean, I do a lot of sketches. In fact, just a second, let me grab it. So I do a lot of sketches like this beforehand, before I paint. You have an idea. But, and these watercolor sketches? Um, no, these are just pencil graphite oh. kinds of sketches. Oh, they're graphite. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I, did I move it away too fast? Yeah, it's kind of... Cause okay, I'm sorry. Here, I'll hold it there for a little bit. Okay, so this is pencil. Yeah, so these are pencil sketches that I do um, trying to figure out what's going to be the best kind of composition and what makes sense. So, because they're so smooth, is this really on soft, you know, because they, they don't seem to be, you know, normally with graphite, you see a little bit more especially sketches, they seem, uh, yeah. I'll try to hold it closer, but yeah, it's just on the rich, richest so and sketchbook. Pardon? Your transitions are really subtle in your sketches. Yes. Yeah. yeah I don't do uh, no tan okay. when I do this. For me, it, I tried it and it works. It helps, but I prefer to do it this way to have more of a plan to me. Okay. That's fine. I have a variety of values. So, but when I do watercut, when I used to do watercolor, I'd have to sketch out things like that and have a plan because as you know, you have to start from light to dark. And with oil paintings, sometimes I, I sort of start from a mid-tone when I paint and then I add in the darks and I add in the light. So I don't necessarily just start with the darks and work towards the light using oil, but I always have a plan of some sort. Well, you did, with the sketches you showed, uh, me, uh -huh. you had your big shape. You, you really yep. applied your big shapes and uh, where the smaller shapes would be. Right. And, uh, even to a certain extent where 
where you had higher contrast, that's going to be where your focal point will be. Right. Say that, yeah. So, um, so when you made that transition, what did you, from watercolor to oil, because I do have people who do that, what would okay. you say was the biggest learning curve that you had? Um, believe it or not, the first thing that I learned is, is, you know, with watercolors, when you paint with it, and then you're, you want to switch colors, and you just dip your brush in the water and swish it around and pick your next color. I learned you can't do that with oils. All of a sudden, you have this big gunky mess inside your turpentine container. But um, so uh, Dawn White Law is the person that I took my first oil class with. And she's like, no, 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 don't do that. And just learning how to mix colors and the differences on that. But um, as far as a transition learning, I think it's just a matter of painting a lot. I tended to... When I first started out with oils, what I tended to do was make everything about a middle value all the way across. And they were ugly. Oh my gosh, they were so ugly. Uh, let me show you my cabinet here of just some of the paintings. So I don't know if you can see this. Yes. And then I have three other shelves that are twice as long as that with paintings. Ah, let me move my clock. But this is just part of it. It's not all the ones I've thrown away and stuff, but I have several other shelves of paintings that I've done. And I go back and look at the old ones and they just, they had no, they were just really flat. Whereas with watercolor, I could, because you're sort of forced to start with light and then work your way to dark, I found that I had more contrast in my paintings. So when I first started out with oil, my paintings were really like I said, that all just all mid-tone. In fact, I see that in a lot of people that are painting. Their paintings are really flat. How do I, let me think of something here. Um, let me just grab something from my awful shelf. Let's see. Here's one. This one, I don't know how well it will come across. But it's really, it's got some variety, but it's all flat all through here and there's not much definition between the trees and the ground plane. It's just, it's flat. So a lot of times after I paint these things, I'll come back later and I'll add some contrast to it. But that's what I had a hard time transitioning to. Well, I can see that, um, you know, cause that is a, you know, being, making a decision and, and making something bold sometimes is a, uh, you know, watercolor, you're, you're, you, you can build up to that. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. with, with the, there's a tendency, I think, in oil painting to stay in those middle values, especially when you first start out. Oh, yeah. I see it a lot in my classes. <laughs> I can't hear you. You put yes. it on mute. Uh, my uh, family is waking up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I had to tell them that um, I'm recording. <laughs> So, yes, I'm on a call. <laughs> so anyway, go ahead. I'm going to probably stay on mute unless, unless I have something to say, okay? Okay, that's fine. All that's right. That's fine. So, um, but like I said, that's what I see a lot in myself and other people, particularly if you're plein air painting. I think because you look at something and you're like, okay, I'll paint that and you paint that. And then you go and you look at something else and you're not saying, well, well what's the value of this thing on this side versus the value of the thing that I just painted because your eyes adjust to it. So those are things that I think you have to be aware of is look at and squint a lot and say, and always ask what is the value of this thing compared to the sky versus the ground plane versus what else I just painted. And those go back to those compositional things. You were talking about John Carlson in that the sky's your lightest uh, value. And of course it shines on the ground plane. So then your ground plane's a second. And then on your slanted plane, it's going to have some more light that hits it. And then your upright plane will always be the darkest. Unless, you know, there's always exceptions. You could have the sun, like when it's setting, it's going to be hitting trees or after a storm. But 90% of the time, that rule really, really applies. So it doesn't matter what color you use. What really matters is the value that you're doing and how it compares to other things. And um, that was one of the things I wanted to talk about, if this is okay with you, I'm not sure if this is on your schedule, 
Okay. <laughs> but uh, with there's a book that I, I bought last year, and I absolutely highly recommend it. It's not cheap because it comes with a video and stuff. It's, it's like $300 or something. But it's this book by John Potoshnik. And what it, his theory is, is, is that if you use, if you use um, certain colors off the color, you know, like complementaries and stuff um, on, how do I explain this? Well, you can see where they, he's done this quadratic, this rectangular quadratic. So using yeah. this color, the rule is the only color you can mix are these four and you put those on your palette, like what he shows here. And then you only use those four colors. You don't go back in and dip into um, any, th any of the other colors on your palette. Like you set them completely aside. And then these are all the colors he mixes. So that's something that I've found really valuable. And I wanted to show you based on that one that I had. So what I've been doing are these tiny things. And I said, okay, well, if I took that green and made that my sky color and did my water and did everything else what you know what could I create with that unusual color pattern a lot of purple in there and the sky is actually a white added to the green so in addition to this palette you do get to use a white but you have the I have those four colors but as a comparison I don't know if you can see this same color palette but I just switched it up and said okay now let's make the sky purple instead of green and let's switch out some of these other things but it's exactly the same four colors that was on that and it's sort of like a game it's the only thing only those four colors and it really makes you think about color and value much more than if you were just painting what you see in front of you does that make sense oh i totally agree with you because you know one of the things that Excuse me. One of the things that I was originally, you know, instructed with, with plain air is that you, you copy exactly what's out there. Right. And first of all, you know, maybe you, you check your values that way, mm -hmm. but not necessarily everything because nature doesn't necessarily provide a good composition I or agree. good color. And, yeah. um, limiting your palette like which he did do mm -hmm. the colors let's say he used decided to use a certain blue like ultramarine blue and he was just going to use that and uh you know the three other colors he right. you don't dip into uh her cerulean or a different blue yep you, yep because what you're doing then is you're creating a harmony a natural harmony in your painting mm -hmm. and you construct it that way and you can like that was really interesting, you know, illustration you had between the two paintings, basically using the same color palette, yep. but getting a totally different feel with that, com you know, the way you uh, adjusted the combination and put, put a greater emphasis on other colors and used maybe the other, co other colors less, yep. to a lesser degree and you're creating an entirely different feel. And the word you use that I loved is the yeah. word game, game. It's something yes. you play with. And yes, so, exactly. And, and so you're, you, it's not like, and sometimes your game, you don't win the game. You <laughs> oh, I lose a lot. A lot. <laughs> but, you, but you learn a lot in the game and you have that attitude of gaming, of this being something you're playing with, you're investigating, you're exploring then um, you learn so much, you know, you rather do. than being discouraged, you know what I mean, by, um, uh, you know, by the fact that you're maybe uh, not, it didn't turn out quite the way you imagined. And I think sometimes letting go of what you imagine yep. at the beginning, particularly, is a real important thing to be able to do. Uh, I agree. And that's what this makes you do because you're like, you just so badly want to dip into say like a yellow green and, but you can't because that's not what the rules are. But the thing that I like is you actually paint faster when you have just those four choices and your values tend to be stronger because back to this part, you can see like where the darker values are right here. 
And so if you want darker values, you've got to pop in that purple. You can cross mix some of these colors, but I tried really hard not to do very much of that either, but it forces you to hold those values too. So it makes a lot of decisions for you. Well, but also I think you get some beautiful neutrals. With yes. Beautiful neutrals and most of nature, a lot of nature is neutrals. So I agree. That's really great. Um, so I did another one, not using that, but using a different color combination. And that's what I came up, same kind of rules. And then I have all my little paintings. Then this one, now when we were talking about how nature doesn't provide very much, the reference, I did this off of a photograph, it was all green. Everything in the whole thing was green. And because I could only use like an orange, a purple, I think I, had, I, think I use, actually I think I say I use the same rectangular quadratic color combination. Um, you get your favorites. But my trees are purple. And of course the background's purple, all the upright planes and everything. So um, yeah, it's something to have a lot of fun with. I'm trying to think what else I had that I wanted to show you. Um, oh, let me show you this. This is a fun one. Oops, as everything falls off. Okay, so one of the other things I've been doing when we're talking about general is, is I've been trying to do some different color combinations using John Potoshnik's idea of just limiting the color. So this is what I've been working on is developing some of these paintings oh. with a little different color to them. Yeah, so instead of a dark green here, I've got sort of that blue and that purpley blue that falls in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I've done a larger version of this as one of the paintings I sent you um, in an email. But here's where I'm having a lot of fun is because we don't have these events, why not play with color? So I went and bought a bunch of um, acrylics. That's a different animal working with that, but I've been doing these abstracts, trying to learn how to do that. I don't know if you can see this, but it's, it's using, my husband says it's like walking through a fluorescent forest, but I love it. I'm having such fun with that, and I don't know if you can see it. Well, you know. It's got I, really thick paint. Yes, yes, yes. Now, are you using any additive to your acrylic paint? Uh, yeah. Gel or I, something like that? What am I using? I am using... Oh, modeling paste. Oh, okay. That I mix in with it. And then I have a matte gel. And because I'm in the basement where it's cold, it doesn't dry as fast. So I, I have a little more time. And the matte gel sort of seems to extend its life. That's true. Now, can I ask you, when you work with your acrylic, do you have a dry palette or do you put it underneath? Um, I don't know, because I work with acrylic quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And sure. I have a I use like a paper towel or a sponge and then over that I put uh, either you can get palette paper or you can just use tracing paper on top and put yep. your paint on top of that in a dish of some kind or a container mm -hmm. and it in your paint will really stick not dry out at all I don't know sure if so I use a paper plate <laughs> <laughs> okay. And oh, that's I don't, like the worst thing to do because I was I was teaching. Tell <laughs> you. Well, I use the I use the coated paper plates though, okay. not the ones that absorb. <laughs> Suck all the water out of. No. Them. <laughs> so it, it well, it's just if you want to, if if you're finding your paint color is in your right in the basement, it's cold. It's not going to dry as right. quickly. But if you want to keep that paint really juicy and not drying out and you can actually save it you can actually get a tupperware square put the okay put the uh, paper towels in the bottom and put like um tracing paper on top or you can buy palette paper and put it on top and seal the thing and it'll stay for days oh okay i mean like it's it's better than oil <laughs> I, mean, it's really, it's really, I mean in terms of not drying out because yeah. moisture in there and you'll, okay. you'll save yourself a lot of money with paint so okay. anyway, just a, well I just started so that's good to know yeah, I'm well, just <laughs> I'm just putting paint on the plate and grabbing a palette fun. knife and isn't going crazy fun? isn't it fun though that it, it is and it, it is nice the nice thing about acrylics is that you can go right on top right almost pretty soon you don't have to wait oh I know that's that's the thing that I love like I'll grab this painting again 
I don't know if you can see that, but you know, you start with this dark color and then you lay that, lay the red and then you put this magenta over the top and the next one. And so it's just, yeah, I love how you can layer right away. Now, or close this, to right away. Is this from your imagination or was this based on somewhat, it seems to me like a forest. It is. Okay. So it's, it's, it's imagination. So basically it's laying down all these dark colors underneath and then going back in and doing negative painting. So some of that watercolor experience comes into play and doing that and then start defining your trees and using palette knife and start laying some of these brighter colors over the top to make it pop. It's really beautiful. I'm real excited. I know, I mean, it's been, you know, for me, this, it's forced me to do things that I would have otherwise been worried about, you know, getting ready for an event or something yes. like that. And so I'm, able to experiment more and play, you know, so mm -hmm. I, it's been good learning experience. Good for um, you. I just, it, did, did you have any, did you say you sent me some pictures? Cause I didn't actually see the, did oh. you say you sent me something? Cause I, I didn't yeah. see that. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, that's okay. It was just that abstract painting that I just showed you. Oh, okay. And, um, what was the other one? Oh, it was the larger version of the willow trees. So what I've been trying to do is, is more palette knife painting. Let me grab a different painting. Hang on. I can reach it. Ah, see, I'm going to have to take off my headphones just a moment. All right. So here's the other thing I've been doing more of lately is, is do you still have the green of the trees, but the, the shadows are more purpley color? Yeah. To me, that just, it's a nice complement to the green. Yes. Um, I think purples and blues really make a big difference. But then what I did is, is I, I'm starting to use more palette knife through, through my paintings to give them texture and depth using oil. And like, like right through here, it's drag through to, um, with the palette knife. So I did an underpainting basically through here and then I came back with the palette knife and laid it on top. Okay, I'm gonna, um, I'm, I think I'm gonna share my screen because I think I see a painting that you have on your website that's oh. with a palette knife. And I, okay. I wanna add, just see if I can, okay? Yeah, while you're doing that, I'm gonna grab one other one. Okay. Oh dear. Yeah, that one's definitely palette knife. Yeah, I was gonna say that, but you do have the whole, um, it also looks very thin back here. Can you see my mm -hmm. hand? Yeah, I can. Is the paint um, relatively thin back here? Yeah, a lot of times what I do with palette knife is, is I'll do pretty much an underpainting on it. Mm -hmm. And then the areas where I want to have texture and more depth, then I'll take the palette knife and lay it over the top. So if you look at the upright trees, you can see palette knife. Uh, the ground plane as it gets closer to you has more palette knife and the lower parts there. Yep. So I think it, it just makes a painting more interesting to try yeah. to give it some depth and texture. It's really nice. I mean, it's, this is a little new for you, isn't it? It is. Well, I've been, I started doing it last year, but I didn't really spend a whole lot of time doing it. But um, at, where was it? New Berlin? Yes. New Berlin, yes. They have their plein air event. And I used that John Potoshnik uh, for color choice and found that I could paint a lot faster with palette knife and by limiting my colors that it all just seemed to fall together a lot better. Yes. So I've been working on it for about a year now. It's This is beautiful back here. I mean, and you do have, now talk about Carlson's, um, you've got the sky is the lightest, then the second lightest is the um, the ground here, you know, especially yep. the general ground. And then you have your upright trees that are the darkest. Mm -hmm. And you have your, we don't have mountains. I don't, <laughs> but that's sort of the distance. The you know is yep. little in between and it it's um but it's really fresh um really nice uh, 
piece. I Thank really you. I, I think, think that's where the palette knife makes a difference. I think it does keep it fresher looking. And I think it's a little harder to overwork work a painting when you use a palette knife. I think once you get used to it, you become more decisive on values and colors and you quit messing with it and licking it with your paintbrush. You know, where you just keep working, yeah, I mean, working, and working. Nice, nice spats of color. And, and, you know, even in this area here, it's a similar value, but you still have like color temperature changes mm -hmm. that, that make, uh, create some form, but they still, they're not so different in value that you lose the structure of your design at all. You know, it's oh, good. really nice. Thanks. Really nice. Anyway, well, this is, I, just this wanted, is, uh, I, saw that, I saw that when I was looking at your stuff. <laughs> so, oh, <no. laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. I don't think this is on my website. I got to get some more paintings um, on my website. I don't know about you guys, but it takes me forever to photograph them and get them fixed and put them up on my website. I need to get an assistant. <laughs> this, I don't know if you can see this. You got to hold is, still for a while. Yeah. All right. Hold still. Okay. So this is that John Potoshnik color choice thing. It's a 16 by 20 and I'm going to get closer so you can see some of the texture. Am I holding still enough? Yeah. 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 It's good. It, it's still okay. hard, but yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry guys. But um, the thing that I liked about this is I did the same thing with the underpainting and the palette knife and I got it done in three hours. And so that's a I'm like sizable shape. I mean, that's got to be at least uh, what a sixteen by twenty, maybe. Yeah, that's a sixteen by twenty. And the thing is, is that like these were all those evergreens back there that you know are are dark green. But because I didn't have much in the way of dark green to work with, you say, okay, what other color can I use that would at least give me the right value? And that that's sort of that whole theory is if you get it the right value, it will read like it's supposed to. It's beautiful. It's great. I'm really excited. Now, when you say you, you don't begin with your palette knife, you end with your palette knife. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll start with a palette knife just to lay the paint on, but I'll go over it with my brush. So if I have a painting and I know the sky is going to be blue, I might mix it up with my palette knife, a big thing of blue, put some of that on my, my canvas, and then I take my brush and work it around. So instead of always trying to dig up the paint with my brush, I lay it down with that palette knife. And the nice thing with the palette knife is that it fills in a lot more, more areas than I would with the paintbrush. And then I work my paintbrush around and it thins it as I use it on the, the canvas. Then I come back later, after I've got my clouds and everything else, I'll come back with that, that palette knife and I'll lay in some thick passages where I really want to show color. Okay, so does that make sense? Yeah. Sort of? So you use your palette knife to, to put in a broad stroke of colors and you move it around a little bit with your brush. Right. And then you come back in uh, when you're at near the near closer to the end of the formation of whatever you are making and add thick paint with your palette. Knife. Right. So if you have that thin paint underneath when you drag your palette knife with a different color over the top, you'll see some of that underneath color come through. So you get a little bit of a vibration of colors, particularly if they're complementary colors. And so I think it makes it more interesting versus if I just did all palette knife. Um, if I do an underpainting, like I said, then you just see those two colors. Well, it's, I'm so thankful. Is, uh, is there anything else you would like to share? Because I, I, but I, I think you've been yeah. so generous with your time. And I, 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 I know that you would have loved to have joined us on. I know. Day. And if that ever happens, please just pop in and I'm sure you'll be peppered with questions. <laughs> but I really appreciate what you're sharing and uh, do you have anything that's going on? Nothing other than because there's no events, right? Well, actually there's one that Mineral Point at Paint the Point is actually having their event. So I'm going to go and be one of the three judges there for it. And then I got into Plein Air, Texas, but I don't know if that's going to happen in October or not. Everything else that I was scheduled for has been canceled. But I really just recommend everybody keep painting. It's, it's a hard time, but you know, for most of us, painting is our happy place. And why not you know, keep making beautiful stuff while you can?
Well, thank you so much, Sherry. Oh, thank you, Judith. We're so grateful for you doing this, Sherry Thomas. And um, I'm going to link below where where you they can find your paints and find you. And uh, I hope you have a great day. Thanks. One more thing. I have an Instagram account, sherrythomas.artist, and you'll see the paintings that I never quite get to post on my website up there. Okay, great. Those are easy. I know right. that you can just clip the, take the picture and pop it up there and it works and they leave it have a little editing and it's great. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So All right. Much. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye.